All right, I'm gonna get going in just a minute. Um, Brittany Williams, if I make you a co-host, will you help me with the admit process, please? Thank you. Actually, it doesn't look like I can do that for some reason. Maybe there are too many hosts already. Hmm. Never mind, Britt. Thanks, anyways. Okay. All right. I'm going to admit this last batch for now. Um, and we'll kick it off. Fabian, I know you're on and you're a host. So if you see people in the waiting room while I'm doing the intro, would you mind letting people in? Otherwise I'll let um, the other waiting room people in um, when we hand off the slides. I just made uh, Brittany a co-host. Oh, great, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, let's kick it off. Let me get a little organized with on the various components. Um, okay, so uh, first things first, um, this presentation will be recorded um, on Zoom. So if you don't wanna be recorded, uh, please turn off your video camera and um, keep it off. Um, we record these so we can go back and um, continue to learn from the public presentations um, and conversations we have. So um, I'm going to start the recording now, so please, Turn your camera off if you do not consent to being recorded. Okay. All right. So um, first, or I guess second, I'd like to um, take a minute for a land acknowledgement um, at Maryland's Built Environment School. We believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those who have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land virtually, but usually we collect um, on that land for school to learn to have events like this. Um, and that land was stolen from the Piscataway people by a European colonist. We pay respect to the Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Okay, so I am very, very excited um, to introduce um, Jennifer Lee and James Lang, the co-founders of FIGURE. FIGURE is a San Francisco-based design practice both James and Jennifer are also lecturers at the University of California, Berkeley's Department of Architecture. Jennifer and James have both been recognized individually with design honors and awards, which are too many to list at the moment, um, but more information about them can be found on um, the architecture event webpage. Um, before founding or before co-founding figure, James garnered professional experience in international practices, including Michael Maltzen Architecture, Renzo Piano Building Workshop, OMA, UN Studio, and Diller Scafidio Renfro. Before founding, co-founding Figure, Jennifer worked on high-profile projects at Foster and Partners in Silicon Valley, at J Associates, and Shop Architects in New York. So we are really lucky to have them here today. I am um, excited also for the conversation we will be having after the presentation, so please um, use the chat to write your questions uh, during the lecture or feel free to raise your Zoom hand um, along the way while we um, have that conversation. I'll be moderating, but everyone is welcome to participate. Um, all right, so um, just to put today's conversation in context of the things we've been talking about this semester, um, we have been working under the charge of under construction for this year's or this semester's lecture series. Uh, and the charge of is to consider the areas of our discipline that need attention, reconceiving and reconstruction. 
This semester, we're working to reify architecture through the lenses of how, why, for whom, and by whom, so we can understand the people, processes, and politics behind the final image or rendering, the stories that we don't really get access to all the time. And in doing so, we aim to illustrate the ideas and narratives that will yield a world that is more inclusive, just, and thoroughly considered. Um, we would also like to acknowledge and thank the Colden Coke Florence Endowment for supporting this lecture. Coke Florence uh, Fellowship AA was a principal in Keys, Condon, and Florence, a highly respected DC firm, KCF, eventually merged with Smith, Hinchman, and Grills, a Detroit based firm forming KCF SHG, which later shortened its name to Smith Group. The endowment was established in honor of Mr. Florence by the University of Maryland alumni who were his partners at Smith Group. The Florence Endowment supports annual lectures in the architecture program, just like this one. This is the second to last event in the lecture series for this semester. Um, while the poster has um, the lecture from Fariz Giga on the fourth, Due to um, the emotions and who knows what that will be maybe happening on the fourth, we've pushed that lecture that was supposed to be next week to the following week. So on November 11th, so that's a correction and a change um, to the original plan on the 11th of November, we'll have um, our final under construction lecture. All right, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Jennifer and James. Thank you for being here. And normally there would be a very large welcoming round of applause, but we can just imagine that in the short term. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. Um, we haven't seen your screen share yet. Okay, okay we'll do that now. Um, how's that? Perfect. We can see it full screen and we can hear you just fine. Okay, okay great. You. Yeah, if, if uh, at any point um, you can't hear us or the screen isn't showing up, please let us know. We're all learning to uh, manage things in, in um, the digital space still. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, we would first like to thank Lindsay and the University of Maryland for inviting us uh, to participate in this fall lecture series. We're very grateful for this opportunity to share our process and progress as a young practice. We titled this lecture, uh, which is our first lecture, um, Contingent Figures, because in the way that we've approached our projects, we, we rarely start off with a preconception, whether that's formal, stylistic, or ideological. Uh, rather, in our short journey of building a practice, we found ourselves repeatedly inspired by certain found conditions in the surrounding context of our projects, and our design responses arise out of a sort of adaptive reaction uh, to the immediate contingency of each project. Contingency means a future event or circumstance which is possible but cannot be predicted with certainty. We think that this word speaks volumes about the state in the world we are currently living in and the challenges of building a new practice at this moment. These external pressures surrounding each project and our unique design responses to them have, been, have become for us a new notion of contextualism that extends beyond mere notions of similarity, but tries to tap into a deeper rereading of the invisible systems and structures that surround us. Uh, so we thought um, under construction was an incredibly relevant lecture series framework for us. Um, everything from our identity to our projects are in various states of ad hoc resolution. Uh, we've organized our lecture into four parts. First, we'll speak a bit about the ongoing process of constructing a practice. And then the next three sections, uh, form, material, and place, show how our work begins to respond to these fundamental conditions. 
Um, we'll show a total of six projects uh, and we'll present the work as uh, kind of a behind the scenes peak uh, of our process uh, through sketches, raw computers, screenshots, um, and study models. So James and I met at UC Berkeley as undergraduate students years ago, and later again at the GSD as graduate students. Beyond our shared academic periods, we've had the opportunity to work in many different offices in Europe, Asia, and stateside. It wasn't until 2017 where we both found ourselves back in San Francisco, ready to try something new. And while we appreciated all of the professional experiences we acquired, we really wanted to find our own voice as architects. So, um, so since we've never worked together before, we decided to do a competition as a test or a trial run to see if we could even work together and also see where our interests aligned. For the Satoshi Art Triennial in Japan, we proposed Seagate, a temporary exterior pavilion that straddles the seashore of Naoshima Island. This linear pavilion composed of four connected rooms of varying sizes and openings creates a processional experience to the changing edge of where land and water meet. And whenever we're able to, we, we try to build physical models to understand proportions, materials, and light quality. For Seagate, we built two one-inch equals a foot physical scale models, the first one out of foam core, and the second one clad in glasswood. Here, we're using my laptop um, screen as a digital backdrop, digital backdrop as the first step towards approximating reality. And considering that we're only 10 minutes away from the Pacific Ocean, we brought our model to the beach um, as the next step in approximating the site condition. To replicate the physical effects of occupying the coastline, um, we placed our model on the coastline and got an unexpected dose of reality. Ocean waves do not scale uh, down quite as well as architectural models. And while we lost the scale figure in this incident, we see these mishaps as both fun and as a type of productive messiness. But of course, we eventually did find the correct scale of waves for a model um, at a nearby pond for this final uh, manicured image. Looking back at what we made at the time, we began to develop ourselves a sensibility surrounding these fundamental concerns of form, material, and place. Even though I'd like to say that we're still very, very far away from any kind of manifesto, I think that most of our projects try to essentialize contingent relationships between these concerns. Oh, hold on. Okay, so, there we go. Um, so we actually didn't have a firm name yet when we were making Seagate. Uh, figure came much later. Finding a name for ourselves is a difficult task, but it's a task that any office has to go through. For us, it was creating it was creating a sort of simultaneously obsessive but also non-exhaustive list. Um, indexing precedents from other youngish or well-known offices. Um, we categorize them by types like acronyms, single word, two word names. Um, we even made a sort of poor man's office name generator uh, to the left here. Um, I, I think the only thing we could agree on at the beginning was that our own names wouldn't be in the firm name. So, um, this is just a snippet of our long list of name candidates. We were pretty all over the place. We, we solicited uh, close friends to make comments. You know, one friend uh, you know, said, no one likes it or feels too pretentious or feels too clever. Um, it was definitely not a scientific process. Um, we ended up with figure, but you know, honestly, it took a, a little while for the word to feel like it represented us. 
Uh, this is our first workspace. Uh, it's basically a big table um, next to our friend's garage. Uh, all that matter was it was big enough to build a model on. A few months later, we were able to upgrade to a building that um, was slated for demolition. So we were able to stay here for cheaply for around half a year. Uh, unfortunately, the building no longer exists. And uh, this, uh, well, we got lucky with our next office. Um, we were able to find um, an office with a large communal courtyard. And this is the office that we're currently presenting to you from now. Um, uh, but maybe what was a little bit unlucky was that um, less than a month after we got this office space, COVID hit the US and so the future of the workplace, you know, including our, our own workplace, is quite uncertain. And, and lastly, just to mention that, um, you know, this is Worcester Hall at UC Berkeley, uh, where we went as undergrads and also where we teach now. And so we very much consider the classroom uh, as one of our workplaces. Okay, so for the first pair of projects, we'll focus our narrative on form making as a consequential process. In these two renovation projects, one completed and one under construction, we explore the possibilities of a single formal element that could negotiate programs within an existing context. AIR is a San Francisco based bag and accessories company. In 2014, they launched a successful Kickstarter campaign for their first product, the Air Duffel Pack, with their slogan, Simplify the Way You Carry. It considered the different needs for a work bag and a gym duffel bag and combined them all into a single minimalist backpack for on-the-go consumers. Since then, they have expanded their product to include different types of bags for work, fitness, and travel. Their products are primarily sold online and in major department stores and boutique shops in the US, Europe, and Asia. Air's founder, who is also a Cal Architecture alumni, approached us to design their first brick and mortar in San Francisco. They wanted us to help them translate their brand into a physical environment that could potentially be scaled and replicated in other locations. This 650 square foot uh, ground floor corner unit is situated in the Mission District in San Francisco. Its former life included a dry cleaners and an office space. Um, and so flanking this main central square room is a restroom to the left and an accessory narrow room to the right. We wanted to see how we can translate Air's minimalist and utilitarian ethos into this compact space. These were our initial studies of how a single or a series of built elements could provide a neutral background um, and a simple interaction experience with their product. And after initial client feedback, we decided to um, to develop this particular scheme, which is a single wall and a table in the middle. So in my dining room at the time, we constructed a one inch to one foot scale physical model to test out the proportions of the objects in the space. We even hand carved little airbags out of balsa wood to play with the product arrangement in the model. We were always inspired, or we still are inspired by everyday objects. And for air, we were drawn to the airport baggage carousel as a formal element. The inclined conveyor belt not only displays, but delivers luggage to incoming passengers in an effortless and efficient manner, or at least that's the intent if there are no delays. So we took that inspiration and designed the display wall with a canted surface that could showcase products easily and beautiful, beautifully with its neutral background. The large shape L wall display is set back from the existing wall 
to allow for um, a back of house circulation on this side, which connects the storage room to the right and the restroom to the left. By pushing the wall back from the wall, you have access for additional retail support storage in the poche of this millwork. In the center of the space, um, you have a circular table that's at counter height. So consumers and customers can bring the bags onto that table and, and put their laptops in and try to figure out if the bag works for them. And similar to how it works in school, we use the physical model to show our clients the ideas. And this is done in the actual space. This rendering shows the reconfiguration of that existing partition wall by relocating that door from the middle to the end wall. Um, we're able to then install three large mirrored panels to really double the, the feeling of that space. And our store's uh, contractor and his subcontractor recently completed a professional photo studio nearby. So it was really helpful for us to see this built example for air, looking at how the millwork could be finished with a smooth and seamless surface. Felt like I was walking perhaps on the moon at that point. Um, and so the filleted edge is critical in how they photograph large scale objects in this controlled studio environment. Here's a construction photo of the existing partition wall um, being filled in and reinforced with a mirror. Um, and then the existing green concrete floor was sanded and prepped for a new black dye. This is a close-up showing the panelization of the wall, including the double curvature at the corner. And so the subcontractor built the, this wall similar to how you would build a skate, uh, skate ramp. It's a series of plywood cross sections and um, cladded with thin wiggle board. So we actually completed this store in January of this year, but with COVID and the shelter in place, um, the store has not yet opened. They're planning to have a soft opening sometime this week or next week, so you're the first group to see these completed photos. And here's the wall completed, displaying a variety of products. And another uh, shot of the wall's profile, seen through the mirror. And so it was really critical for us to relocate that door and have this be a full um, mirrored space. And so we really enjoyed collaborating with AIR um, on their first brick and mortar, thinking about the customer journey and all the little details that support the retail experience. Okay. Um... This next project is an interior renovation of an existing brownstone building in Boston. Uh, the original building was probably dated to somewhere uh, between the 1890s and 1900s. Uh, this was the existing interior, which was previously renovated in the early 2000s. Uh, the client's biggest desire was for the home to accommodate spaces of varying sizes. Uh, but currently, the, the stair um, bisected the interior right down the middle, which prevented that. Um, the apartment was only 15 foot wide, which made uh, vertical circulation even more challenging. There are more, many components to this project, but um, I'll focus exclusively on how the stair in this project became the defining challenge uh, in the heart of the project. Um, a quick Quick note on collaboration. Uh, this project is designed in collaboration with a close friend of ours uh, who runs his own practice, J Rock Design, in Boston. Um, I think it's important to uh, talk about collaborators uh, because you know we're a, we're a practice that um, is invested in building. And, and one of the one of these first paradoxes for new practices is that you know one we've 
first got to find opportunities to build. And then two, you've got to make sure you can handle the workload when you're just one or two people. So for us, we decided early on to see our peers and former classmates as potential collaborators. Um, that would allow us to sharing opportunities and, and to also have our hands in more projects uh, at a given time. And so um, looking at the images, one of our first design tasks uh, was to try out all possible configurations of stairs in this narrow house, from keeping portions of the existing stair to new stairs reoriented longitudinally, to cascading, to stacked stair runs. It quickly became clear that a simply, simply stacked stair would not be able to offer the type of programmatic flexibility that was required in the house. So ultimately the solution was that the stair core that diagonally cascades from top to bottom. And not only that, the, the flights had different lengths and different landing conditions based on adjacent programs. Um, and so winder treads had to be employed in order for the stair to uh, span each floor in such a compressed width. So extreme narrowness coupled with changing programmatic requirements uh, produced this highly eccentric but specific form. This geometric misbehavior isn't something that uh, we had a preconception of, um, but rather it's a unique product of the circumstance. So having such a complex stair form dancing through the building does create other complications. Uh, here are some screenshots um, where you see the stair geometry conflicting with the fireplace flue, which has its own constraints and requirements. So, you know, ultimately it was interesting to see the stair push against adjacent rooms um, and architectural systems, and for those things to push back on the stair as well. Uh, so this image is uh, also part of a series of diagrams we produced to show the framers um, the changing relationship between framing and stair treads. Um, you know, in some cases, the tread, treads are actually sitting on top of the framing. And so it, it, got, it got pretty complicated. And this is the final scheme we arrived at. Um, as the stair unwinds and cascades, it allows for programs to grow on the south side and shrink on the north. The master closet, the fireplace flue, and the kitchen cabinetry all become a sort of thickened poche uh, and a type of bridging element between the stair and the, the adjacent spaces. And so a, a, a sequence of images, uh, renderings um, that show the stair design. This is the view from the stair and from the brownstone entry. Here is the entry of the stair uh, with the flight leading up to the master suite and down to the kitchen. And this is mid flight up to the master suite. This is the uh, flight up to the guest suite. And then finally an aerial view uh, looking down from the guest suite level. So after locking down the, uh, the design uh, intent, was a, there was a particularly intense period of trying to figure out what type of documentation we needed to communicate that intent uh, to the general contractor. And so, you know, we, we quickly discovered that typical architectural drawings couldn't fully describe the stair because it, it kept shifting in section and plan. Um, even though, you know, we had a, a set of detailed stair drawings. And so what, what we really needed um, was a singular drawing that could simultaneously describe the diagram in, in, in its entirety um, and as the relationship between the built parts. Um, and so we, we ended up making this enlarged stair plan that collapsed all of the flights across the different levels into a, su a single superimposed plan. Um, this false projection was the only way that one could see the stair in its entirety. Once, once the stair started construction, we were really excited, um, but you know, also soon realized that we needed an even higher resolution 
drawing for the stare. So communicating intent during construction really relies on a back and forth process uh, between architect and contractor to iron out misalignments, uh, literally and uh, figuratively. So when it became apparent that the previous stair plan wasn't detailed enough, we had to go back and produce uh, an even more obsessive drawing. Um, you know, this drawing offsets all of the finished surfaces inward to the structural elements so that it showed the, you know, exact relationship between every tread and adjacent framing member. Um, everything, everything that was possibly dimensioned uh, was dimensioned. Um, uh, and this was done so that uh, we could make sure everything fit together. Um, we couldn't even be off uh, more than a quarter of an inch. So these two construction images look almost identical, um, but you might notice that on the left image, uh, this set of framing fits proud of the treads, the stringer as well. Um, so that is actually inaccurate. Um, so there were so many micro adjustments that we had to make uh, during construction and during the framing process. And so the image on the right, you see that um, all of these elements are toe planar. And so that's, um, that's correct. And here's an image of the stair as of last week with the subflooring fully built out. Uh, we look forward to seeing this twisting and wound stair take shape in, in the coming weeks. Okay, moving on uh, to the next chapter. Um, the following two projects in this section attempt to play with material conventions. How can one reframe a material in an unintended way to suggest new effects as well as new performative or social utility? Supporting Act was our uh, competition proposal for the 2019 Ragdale Ring, which is an annual competition for a temporary community performance space at the Ragdale Foundation outside of Chicago. The site itself is an open lawn area within a larger campus of surrounding buildings that house staff, artist residents, and other support functions. The Ragdale Foundation and Ragdale Ring um, actually has a pretty long history. So Chicago architect Howard Van Doren Shaw first built the Ragdale Ring in 1912 for his family and friends to stage plays. We were drawn to this playful figuration in the stage set uh, in this historic photo and how the arch portals begin, began to create a frame for the stage while almost floating above and touching down delicately on the stage itself. Um, around the same time, we became fascinated with EPS foam, uh, which is also known as geofoam, um, and the you know, more consumer variety known as styrofoam. Uh, what may or may not be common knowledge is that outside of consumer use, geofoam is widely used in infrastructural and landscaping projects um, since it's a far lighter and more stable material alternative to soil or concrete. And so you would be able to find it under uh, various bridges, paved plazas, um, or even under artificial terrains uh, under parks, such as the Maggie Daly Park in Chicago. The foam is also used widely to make theatrical stage props. We were interested in foam's performative role in supporting the built environment behind the scenes and wanted to instead bring foam's materiality into the foreground uh, to celebrate its, its material attributes. We, we quickly knew that we wanted to create a structure that turns the lawn into a large stage uh, through an act of framing. We then were uh, able to quickly focus on the shaping of individual elements. We thought we could reference the playful figuration in Van Doren Shaw's stage design or relocate this moment at the bottom of each column to suggest the sort of instability or uh, animated quality like dancing feet, um, which was also enabled by the foam's inherent light. The final scheme was a cast of characters, 19 columns and 23 beams. Uh, the beams would be 15 foot long between columns showing off the material's incredible volume to weight ratio. 
There is an outer perimeter of columns that define the overall performance and audience areas. And then the square is further divided to give a stage-like presence towards one end. Um, there are three circular elements um, intersect the columns or inhabit the space, um, the largest becoming the stage itself and the others becoming seating elements. So our mock-up process begins with a small model, this one made of uh, basswood. There was uh, a decision to embrace the artificiality of the stage set in the model. So we left the framing exposed at the outer perimeter of the model. Here are some, uh, some of the finished model photos. And even though the pavilion is made of repeating elements, we could still create a lot of variation um, through changing spacing and orientation of individual pieces. Uh, and so here is a view of the model from up above. We developed a very simple connection detail for uh, the beam to column interface, a set of rigid plates in, in conjunction with a pair of cables would actually hold the pavilion down. Um, the foam would be so light that the primary structural concern was uplift and preventing everything from flying away. So we went to a local foam supplier to learn more about the material. Uh, there's a wide range of densities available from 0.5 pounds to nine pounds per cubic foot. Um, and they could produce single pieces as large as two by four by 15 feet. Here's a, an image of me trying to demonstrate remotely to Jen how light this stuff is. Uh, so at this point, we wanted to produce a proof of concept. Um, so we decided to make a two to one mock-up of a single space module to test the actual material properties. So in reality, these columns would be nine foot tall, but here they're four and a half foot tall. Fortunately, I, I was able to enlist the help of some students to set up the mock-up. Um, this student here is carrying beams that are eight foot long uh, without too much of a struggle. Uh, the snow was the tough part. We were, uh, we managed to get this thing up for a few minutes, um, uh, but of course, since for this mock-up, we thought we could get away with um, the actual uh, joinery between pieces. Um, the winter winds quickly blew the structure down, um, but it was a pretty fun uh, time setting it up. And I thought the scheme looked pretty good too um, in its mid collapse state. Uh, so we, um, we tried again in a more controlled environment um, and uh, had a little more success in, in keeping the structure up. Um, and here is another image of the mock-up in a different configuration. And I'll end with a little clip of a video we made um, for the project. Uh, it looks like it's kind of choppy, so I do apologize. All right, well, maybe we can keep moving then. There's actually a nice soundtrack to this, too. <laughs> um, okay. okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the second project within the material series. Um, earlier this year, we won an invited competition to design a temporary outdoor installation that explores craft through art and architecture. This installation is the inaugural project of a five year long partnership between two LA cultural institutions, materials and applications and craft contemporary. And in July, we were thrilled to receive additional support from the Graham Foundation. Materials and Applications curates experimental art and architecture installations, as well as hosts a range of public programming that engages with contemporary cultural issues. 
Craft Contemporary, formerly known as the Craft and Folk Art Museum, which you could see with their formal logo, exhibits contemporary art, craft, and design, and makes it a mission to feature oftentimes underrepresented artists and designers from larger institutions. So Craft Contemporary, located on Mid-Wilshire Mid Boulevard in LA, across the street from LACMA, currently has this tricolor facade. And just to the east of it, um, it's the courtyard and the site of our installation. Craft Contemporary has undergone a series of renovations by different architects since its inception in 1973 most notably by Hodgson Fong in the mid-90s and later by Frederick Fisher and Partners. The courtyard really does expand their museum exhibition space and offers larger opportunities for programming. We were drawn to the eclectic set of elements and details of the existing site. Each of these moments represented an author completed at a specific time in the museum's long history. And as we considered the brief itself, uh, a call for a temporary installation, we could not help but look around the city for inspiration. Construction tarps or scaffolding netting are robust, uh, porous, colorful textiles that have inadvertently become a near permanent facade aesthetic through the ubiquity of construction in our city. These textiles perform a dual role. First, um, to keep people, objects and debris from falling out. And second, as a veil to keep the building hidden from view. We propose to cloud the Craft Contemporary Courtyard entirely in these construction textiles. So within all the visual noise of the courtyard from the brickwork, glass, steel, and painted patterns, we would use construction textiles as a veil to screen certain elements and highlight others. Through a quarter inch scale physical model, we played with different fabrics and porous materials to test ways to engage with the existing context, ways to create a collage of color, texture, and light, and ways to frame details. And ultimately, ways to create a sense of place. By opening up the interior of this faux construction site, we imagine that the courtyard could become the site of storytelling by construction workers or a round table for a contentious debate on the future of construction in LA, or it can host public programming workshops for building and making. After we won the competition, we researched various performative aspects of construction fabrics and we even acquired a 14 foot tall scaffolding tower and built it in our former lobby as a way to test connections between fabric and structure and its behavior when hung, gathered and cut. We also visited several scaffolding vendors in Southern California, including CSI and Gardenia. Here's Sergio showing us the various scaffolding components and their typical rosette connection. And so we were in the process of finalizing the scheme by simplifying the perimeter wall and standardizing the scaffolding components. And then COVID-19 emerged. We were originally supposed to open this summer um, and now are anticipated to open sometime next year. With all things considered, we're using this additional time as an opportunity to reconsider the narrative and design that speaks better to the current time. Okay, in this last section of projects, we'll share two projects that come out of a 
direct reaction to the physical surrounding of the site. Uh, this past year, events like the pandemic um, really revealed the importance of creating and having access to outdoor space um, and the ongoing climate crisis of wildfires uh, here in California and elsewhere um, also necessitate a sort of reframing of our relationship to landscape and wilderness. So House of Courtyards is a concept design for a private residence and bed and breakfast. The project was designed in collaboration with Studio Straff, uh, an architecture studio based in Belgium, uh, run by another good friend of ours. The site uh, was quite stunning, uh, located in Oregon wine country. It was, a it was, it was unique in that um, surrounding this parcel of woodland, most of the other sites had already been cleared for vineyards, um, but we, you know, we thought the, the woods um, that remain on this site uh, was uh, absolutely a gem and that we should keep it. So we, we thought to come up with a design that was nestled or even hidden uh, within these woods. Uh, for this project, we started with an idea of capturing or enclosing this existing landscape at a variety of scales using simple architectural devices. What emerged was a series of permutations on the idea of a house of courtyards or a courtyard within or courtyards within courtyards within courtyards. Um, and that was, you know, that was one moved uh, through the site to the building, one would experience a series of nested microcosms of the greater landscape. Um, regardless of the proportions and layouts of the programmatic spaces, um, or whether it was rectangular or circular. There was always this idea of the communal courtyard at the scale of the entire building and smaller courtyards at the scale of the room or individual. Even after we settled on the general massing, proportion and orientation uh, continued to be adjusted. The sequence of entering the building is such that when you cross the threshold of the perimeter walls, you find yourself under the cover of the, this perimeter walkway. Then you, you actually circulate around this um, covered arcade before uh, making your way into the actual main building. In the final part T, the main building is subdivided into seven program bars separated by a thickened service wall that housed everything from closets to bathrooms to fireplaces to seating. The public programs were connected by a sequence of oblique portals uh, forming an implied diagonal corridor that allowed for the changing sizes of public spaces, as well as an unexpected way to move through a building with an otherwise very rigid party. In the floor plan, you can see the sequence of five public spaces. Um, it's sort of dancing along the two edges of the building. When you enter, you've got the main lounge, you've got the dining and kitchen to one side, and a library and a quiet lounge um, on the other. Uh, within each of the seven program bars uh, was also a smaller conceptual courtyard. Um, some of them are physical courtyards, others become uh, pushed to the perimeter, become terraces that look out, um, or even a large skylight uh, um, lighting the main lounge area. And lastly, we have the owner suite on one side and the, the guest suites on the other side of the building. Here are um, a few quick interior vignettes we did to show how each space is either oriented to the view out or the view back in, um, and also uh, a view of the diagonal onslaught uh, and the interior. Uh, the following are some of the shots uh, of the physical model we made. The roof comes off. And 
here's another shot um, with the roof off of that interior organization. And you can see from this uh, view that the primary mass of the building is pushed uh, back and tucked into the hillside. So really as with you, when you approach the building, um, it's, its presence is very much uh, muted or more hidden. As part of the process, we also produced a series of layered elevational drawings uh, that were then animated. Um, these were these drawings were physically pr uh, printed, layered, um, and then photographed. So, hopefully, this can play. So we were, we were thinking about how to give flat architectural projections, such as um, an elevation drawing uh, depth, both temporally and spatially. Um, the dots you see underneath the section line um, are, are actual planimetric locations of trees on the site with approximate um, dimensions of their trunks. Um, the, the blurring you see is an inherent material effect from the layering of vellum. It's nothing has really been post-processed digitally. Sorry, hold on. Okay. Okay, okay. so here's one more uh, iteration um, where uh, we use the flashlight um, to backlight this image um, to try to visualize the quality of um, uh, being and building in this very specific place uh, at night. Okay. Um towards the end. I'm going to close this lecture with one of our in-progress residential projects for Paradise. Paradise is a small town in Butte County, about three hours northeast of San Francisco. In 2018, Paradise suffered the state's deadliest wildfire that killed 85 people and destroyed over 150,000 acres, according to Cal Fire. The incident known as Camp Fire displaced thousands of people. According to the 2010 census at the time, Paradise had over 26,000 residents. Last year, through local and state reports, it was estimated that only two to 4,000 residents remain in the town. We learned about Rebuild Paradise Foundation from our office mates, Obata Noblin, another young practice for you to check out. Rebuild Paradise is a nonprofit with a mission to help displaced residents rebuild their homes by lowering the barrier um, to repopulate disaster struck areas. They work with a network of community leaders and members, uh, private and corporate donors, design professionals, government agencies to offer a variety of resources that support the rebuilding process. For example, they have insurance guidance, land mapping, and drone services. Another resource they're developing is the Residential Floor Plan Library. It's a collection of floor plans available that range um, or that have two to three bedroom single family homes. So the organization supports the engineering and government agency review fees for these plans. So if a resident is ready to rebuild their home, they can choose the floor plan from the library and get connected directly with the architect. All of these plans have been vetted and approved um, for master plan. And so they're trying to lit, like speed up and expedite the process of building. There are currently six approved plans in the library with many, many more to come. When we spoke to the director earlier this month, they had about five houses under construction from the floor plan library. 
And it's been really inspiring to see all of their construction updates on their social media page. Um, and so we wanted to help the Paradise community by contributing a plan. After our initial discussions with the director, we knew that we wanted to design a simple yet carefully considered home. We believe that good design should come at any price point. And so, this, so the means of economy shaped how we approached the project from the very beginning. We referenced off-the-shelf standard products from Lowe's website to use as our kit of parts. The RFP itself um, was kind of open-ended. It just uh, requested either a two or three bedroom house that ranged from 800 to 1800 square feet with an optional garage. We initially developed three plans that explored different ways in which the house can engage with nature. So in the first option, we were looking at how a porch um, can still be connected to the community and the neighborhood. The second option looked at maybe um, an interior courtyard. And then the third one is um, the development of patios that become the resultant space of this cruciform shape. So based on um, the community feedback, we're currently in the process of developing option one, which is the first option that you saw before. It's the smallest one that we're proposing at 890 square feet. Um, the house in general groups all of the support spaces. So the kitchen, the bathroom, the closet, the laundry into one map. This becomes the dividing area between two identical bedrooms and the large common space to the right. And then it also features an extensive porch um, in the front and back. So gable and hip roofs make up the majority of the residential housing stock in Paradise. In this project, we're exploring how simple adjustments to the gable roof in conjunction with standard awning and single home windows can produce different facades on every elevation. The front elevation here features a string of clerestory windows that bring indirect light into the home. There's a circular picture window um, above the uh, living space. And in the rear elevation, a series of single hung windows are ganged up together with a sliding patio door to maximize glazing into the backyard. And with a steep eight to 12 pitch roof with a stable structure, um, the poche allows for additional storage in this very compact house, which can be accessed through the bedroom. And the main common space features high slope ceilings and uh, naturally um, natural cross ventilation. So as we've witnessed this year, um, California's wildfire season is becoming commonplace. This was taken outside my apartment in September on the apocalyptic day. The season's poor air quality has prevented us from visiting Paradise earlier this fall, but we do plan to make a trip out there on Friday um, with hopes that we'll continue the design process and have this plan available to residents early next year. So we're gonna end the lecture with this timeline. Um, when Lindsay invited us to lecture, we realized that um, we had never actually charted out the timeline of starting our own office. Um, so in, in 2017, we both uh, quit our jobs knowing that we wanted to start something for ourselves. Um, but in the subsequent two years, as we began collaborating, we were still each uh, off doing our own things. Um, Jen was traveling for her uh, Roch Traveling Fellowship. I was teaching in Syracuse. And so we were in the same place until really the second half of 2019. Um, I think it goes uh, to show how fuzzy the notion of a, of a start is. Um, and, you know, lastly, we, we sort of jokingly drew this 
a green line um, that represented uh, our optimism during the entire process. And, and the reality is that um, creating a practice is a series of ups and downs. Um, and, you know, 2020 has been an incredibly challenging year. Um, but it was also a time for us to reflect our, on our own values uh, and find new directions. So we, we are ending the year with, um, uh, uh, you know, slightly more optimi optimistic note. Uh, and we're excited to test some of these ideas, uh, new ideas for our future projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James and Jennifer. Um, I have lots of questions. Um, and if anyone else has questions, please drop them in the chat or um, feel, free, feel free to raise your hand or um, uh, um, jump in that way. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, worth acknowledging maybe how perfectly oriented this lecture was, I think, to, um, to students and to and a school audience in general, thinking about your process and, and the ways you've talked about your work and how that um, is so directly tied to a studio environment of experimentation, of making, of um, uh, kind of the, the whole the whole gamut of medium, whether it's, um, you know, vellum or models or um, taking your model outside. Uh, and I was actually listening to, this is a little bit of a tangent, but there's a question. Uh, I was listening to a Liz Diller lecture last night where she was talking about how when she graduated school, she didn't think, or, uh, she didn't think you could practice architecture and make buildings with ideas and that over time she has come to sort of move from the school environment where anything seemed possible and um, through an art practice arrive back at buildings where she felt like she could work on buildings with ideas. And I think students often have a similar question about, you know, this is school, does it connect with what practice is like and how do I bridge that? And um, and I think you guys are a great example of doing all the things that we encourage students to do all the time, like making models and study models and, um, you know, doing research about their ideas. So can maybe can you guys talk to um, the, the role that the process has for you and that the process is inherently um, model making and material testing and working through ideas to arrive at uh, a proposal or an intervention. Should I take this? Um, we can jump. I can jump. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, in in many ways, um, in the way we practice, or you know, at least for me, I still feel like a student, and I, I want to approach projects as if I were a student. You know, um, I think oftentimes when when you've practiced for a long time. Uh, professionally, um, there is a tendency to trust solutions that you've already um, done in the past. So you're, you, you know that's successful and it's easy, so why not do it again? I, I, I think for us, um, every project um, we start, we try to start with kind of fresh eyes uh, with a certain um, intentional naivete, like like, what if it were different? How, how could it be different? And, and I think this sort of more experiment, uh, experimental mode of practice is really important for us. Um, it means getting your hands dirty, um, you know, uh, making, you know, it's, it's both sort of practical and uh, idealistic that we're still making models ourselves. Um, you know, it's, it, it's important to not remove yourself from the directness of the process. Um, and so I think in that we, we find a lot of, um, you know, happy accidents or, or moments of uh, inspiration from just being, being sort of approaching things almost like a student uh, with, with fresh eyes. Yeah, and I, I would say that the, the biggest difference is that these projects oftentimes 
are real. There's a budget, there's a client, there's a site, and there's so many other regulations and factors that come into play that you may not have in school. And so we've really tried to work with our clients and have, you know, it's a collaborative process through the whole thing. Um, and I think what's interesting is that we kind of balance each other out. Um, I'm always dragging James towards the middle to be understanding of sort of the pragmatics. And he's always trying to push me to the other side and then trying to figure out where's their idea. And so we are always sort of balancing, you know, our interests and making sure that a good design actually works. Um, and if we can create the right uh, documentation and create the right, you know, drawings, whatever it is to display and communicate that idea, then we have a better shot of selling it. Um, because I think a lot of people are comfortable with what they know. And if we could try to show them something different that still works, um, we think that's kind of a successful sort of direction to proceed with. Yeah, and there's a question in the chat um, that maybe, maybe I can elaborate on a little bit that I think is in line with what we're talking. In the market, how do you balance the creativeness versus client needs and budget issues, which is exactly what we're talking about. So maybe um, since now we're familiar with so many projects of yours and we've seen um, all the different types of representation ways you work, can you give a specific example maybe of um, in, in maybe one of the projects we've seen where you've worked through that push and pull between, um, like it says in the chat, creativeness and uh, client needs and budget issues. Which one do you want? Uh, I don't know, which, um, trying to think of a specific example. Um, well, so in AIR, um, we didn't show you exactly what that existing demising wall was, um, but the budget was, I would say, um, somewhat modest. And, but we respected that, like we knew that that's what they wanted to spend. And we were trying to find ways to, how, how can you maximize design given all the constraints? Um, and so we had to sort of pick and choose and maybe scale down the efforts in other areas and reuse certain things and not change the light fixtures in other rooms. And, you know, we were, it was a game of math as well. We were trying to figure out, so where can we get the most bang for, you know, our money? Um, and I think in the end, it, it ended up being like, I think we're all quite happy with that space and how it turned out. Um, but it's always a balance and we always respect what the clients need and want and what they're comfortable with. Um, and so we try to find other ways to sort of, at least in the budget, try to pick and sort of shuffle things around. I, I think another example, um, you know, within a project in the public realm, um, Veilcraft, it's it's a project funded through, uh, you know, um, materials and applications uh, that are nonprofit. And then we got a little bit of additional support from the Ground Foundation. So it's, it's a fixed project and a pretty limited budget. And so, you know, um, in, in all of our projects, especially in the public projects, um, we want to figure out as early as possible how far this um, budget can take us. And so, like, we, we had that initial concept of using um, construction textiles and scaffolding. But beyond that, like, how much scaffolding can we actually rent? Mm -hmm. What configurations cost more or less? Those are all big variables. Um, you know, how long are renting it for? So, like, um, we reached out to these uh, subcontractors, uh, like, really early on the pro in the process so that we can work with them also in a collaborative mode, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the people who are the general contractors or the fabricators who are making the things um, in the traditional practice, it's always kind of, we just pass off drawings and that's it. But in a lot of our projects, we actually have a uh, much more of an interactive process. We're like, Hey, Sergio, we've got this design. How much does it cost? Oh, wait, it needs to be smaller. How about this? How about that? And then, so it's, it's sort of a back and forth. Um, we don't compromise on our um, like fundamental con concept or, or design ambition, um, but we work with um, uh, you know different different people to to bring it into reality uh, in, in a sort of realistic way. Um, 
And another question in the chat um, that, you know, I think some of those question or that question comes out of your past experience and, and what you've learned up to this point. Um, and there's a question that sort of um, asks about your next chapter um, and uh, how you're thinking about what projects you take on. Um, so how do you decide what projects you're going to pursue? Um, how do you shape um, kind of your, your energies in terms of um, yeah, developing your body of work looking forward? I, I think um, it's, again, really a balance of um, what you are intentionally pursuing and also just what comes to you and um, also the decisions that um, are required to keep the firm uh, running from a financial standpoint. And so like, I think I would say that, um, you know, at the moment, we have a very uh, open mind in terms of what we, what come, you know, we'll, we'll take on almost anything that comes to us. But at the same time, we, we are very mindful in that we don't want to be that only do a certain type of project. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, friends would ask us, oh, are you a residential architect? Are you a commercial architect? You know, like those ty types of um, typical conventional classifications and market sectors. We, we would like our practice to bridge across all of that. We're deeply interested in public architecture. Um, and so I think having our hands in just multiple arenas and, and different types of projects um, keeps, keeps the, you know, keeps the practice and keeps our creative minds fresh. Yeah, and maybe to address Kayla's initial question, um, I would say the biggest challenge so far has how do we get projects? When you're starting off, it's not like there's a line of people wanting you to design stuff. So we've, and we're still trying to figure out how to be creative with finding things. Um, and it's, you know, it's been tough this year. We've been very fortunate with collaborating with um, peers from, from school and in other realms. Um, but as we try to balance the seeking part, we also are busy trying to do um, competitions that may not take up that much time, but still allow us to still try different ideas um, um, concurrently, so. Yeah, I think um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't, you can't control everything. So I think being spongy and um, ambitious at the same time has obviously been really productive um, and based on that green, green line in this last <laughs> slide, I think it's trending back up. Um, and, and going back to something you talked about in the beginning, but maybe never um, gave us or, or fully divulged is how you landed on the name figure after all the options uh, you went through in that rigorous process, you know, how did you decide on that? Um, sort of one word, maybe manifesto identity starting point? Um, this might be a tough one. Um, it, I, I guess maybe we can just, just talk about, I, I eventually uh, came to like the word and what it represented because of its, um, its sort of many uses um, and, and state. Um, you know, figure, I think we, we asked a lot of people and for everyone, like something different came up um, from like figure, like figure ground, numerical figure. Um, I think the, the use that I am most drawn to now is um, the word as an act or a verb. So to figure is for us, I think means a continuous state of inquiry. So to like figure something out to, and that sort of continuous act of figuring um, and, and not necessarily having preconceptions. Um, so I, you know, I, I, 
I, the word is, um, it's in its many manifestations became, um, uh, I know, kind of poetic, I thought. I don't remember how we arrived to that. I know that we, we were struggling for a very long time, um, but I think it, it somehow, it seemed fitting at the time and we're still trying to figure out some. Yeah, we had a client the other week, which is, we showed them a design and he's like, this doesn't look like you guys. And we're like, well, we don't even know what it, like, what is it that looks like us? Like, we don't know. Um, and we're still honestly um, exploring through these different types of projects what that thing is. Um, so. And if anyone else, Joseph, I see you maybe went on, on video muted. So if you want to chime in or if anyone else wants to chime in, I want to give a minute for people to just participate um, on microphone. <laughs> no, that was a really interesting presentation. Uh, I didn't have a particular question. Oh, okay. in, no I did want to congratulate the two architects. I just saw you. You. you were already on video, but you just popped up. And so I thought maybe you were teeing that up. Um, are there any offices you would like to collaborate with coming through the chat? I think I know this person. Um, <laughs> Hi, Samson. He's in London. Um, we're open to collaborating with, we're open and we're, you know, eager to work with others. Um, like, wouldn't it be so great if we didn't see each other as competitors? I think we all just do like really cool and more interesting work together. Um, I think, uh, like it, I guess in my, in my own experience with the older generation, like people that I work for um, are often so protective of their own authorship. Um, but I don't know, I feel like in, in this sort of new era with our new generation, maybe, maybe there can be a more open model, like, um, like shared authorships um, and, and different modes of collaboration. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I think picking who you collaborate with is, very important like you got to make sure you get along and that you have similar ethos but you know beyond that uh, like yeah we're very open yeah and the two projects that we showed um the house in oregon and the house in boston those were bi-coastal and you know across the country collaborations and and now we you know we use slack all the time we're always on Zoom calls. And so this sort of digital remote way of working is actually expanding our, our reach in, in collaborating with others that are not necessarily in our city. Um, so it's, it's pretty exciting um, to work across time zones. I think that's really spot on. And I, I think there's lots of offices that are small and midsize and young and growing that um, are thinking about exactly what you said, this way to be big and small at the same time. Um, and James, I think it's really an, an apt and interesting observation that firms um, that have come before or, or architects that have come before have been really defensive of authorship. And I wonder, um, or that made me wonder um, in a more self-reflective way, what are younger architects protective of, if not authorship? Is there something that we are blind to that we're cagey about or, or overlooking that could produce more interesting work or more collaborations or more work in general? I don't know if there's an answer to that, but your question made me wonder, you know, like what is, what is a, a kind of young architect or a student graduating from school entering the workforce um, or, or maybe not entering it in so binary, but kind of moving down that road. Um, is there something that we might be able to self critique or spot in our own, in our own ways of working that would be better if we just left it behind? Yeah. Um... You know, in, in some ways, we, we will rely on 
the students in, in this room and, and the next generation to call us out on it, right? Um, um, but then, you know, that, that's kind of one of the joys of teaching as well, that you are interfacing with kind of the next generation of architects. And um, something that our students are um, kind of really observant about are, um, you know, what kind of clientele do you take on and and based on that, you know, what are what are you complicit in in terms of like perpetuating certain systems um, of prejudice, right? And so, like, I think as we continue to practice, we're gonna have to be much more mindful of that um, as well. And and I, I think it's it's a great thing when you can have these kind of intergenerational dialogues. Um, and and so uh, that's something that we found productive. I think that's a very, very good answer and very good reflection. Um, okay, well, I know you have to head to studio on the West Coast um, and we're just about wrapping up our time. So if anyone has any final questions, last call. Um, could I ask one? Yes, of course. Okay, so I think like San Francisco is like a pretty competitive market when it comes to architecture. Is there a moment where you both felt like there was like a breakout project or something that kind of set your mark as, okay, this is what we're doing. Like you had the graph of your optimism and developing your firm, but is there any moment where you were like, oh, we've made it? No, no, <laughs> we, we're far from making anything really. <laughs> that, that, that moment, I, I hope is in the near future. Um, it hasn't happened yet, I would say. Listen, to me, you guys have made it, so <laughs> you got it. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Uh, we're, taking, we're taking each week at a time. <laughs> Thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, thank you again, um, Figure, James and Jennifer. Uh, again, a warm, warm kind of mental round of applause um, for your <laughs> work, for your um, successes and, and willingness to share it with us. Um, and we'll have to have you back for reviews and other things sometime soon. Great, looking Great. forward to it. Thank thanks you so for, much. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Work hard in studio. <laughs>